So it has thermodynamics rather than uh, thermodynamics of small systems, as, as some people do. Um, I'm using here uh, the slides because I also want to show you that this is, these are not only theoretical concepts, but that you can actually measure these quantities. And I would like to show you examples uh, from the real world. And I hope you'll forgive me that I've basically chosen examples where I've been uh, involved in. So I will not post specific lecture notes, but there is this uh, large review, about 50 pages, to 600 references, and I try to keep the, the chapters also uh, in pedagogical style. So you can, I mean, it's linked on my homepage. You will easily find it uh, on the internet. I should also. Um, mentioned that there will be some overlap with what uh, Abhishek told you, but I'll try to, I think stochastic thermodynamics is more than just talking about uh, fluctuation theorems, which are a very important part of the field, and I will give you my perspective on, on some of the topics he raised in, the, in his lecture. Okay, so uh, the plan for today is that I will start um, comparing classical to stochastic thermodynamics, and I will especially then talk about the first law on this small scale, and then talk about general fluctuation theorem and the Yazinski relation, and as one kind of application, I will tell you a little bit about optimization. Okay, so let me start with putting the field into a historical perspective. Uh, you all know that classical thermodynamics has been developed about 200 years ago when people wanted to understand the rules, how to convert different forms of, as we now would say, energy, heat into work, and vice versa. And the knowledge then could be summarized uh, in these two relations. The first one is the first law, the second one is the second law. And this was, of course, a phenomenological theory developed uh, extracting information uh, from exper experiments and trying to rationalize it. So classical thermodynamics has, has two parts. One deals with equilibrium systems and one deals with transformations between systems. Now the equilibrium part got a thorough <laughs> mathematical uh, underpinning or theoretical underpinning uh, through the works of Maxwell, Gibbs, and Boltzmann, as you know. And again, if you want to summarize uh, that knowledge in, in one expression, perhaps you could use the Boltzmann factor, which tells you that for a system in contact with the heat bath, the probability that at any given instant you encounter a microstate with a label I is given by this exponential factor where F is the free energy used here for normalization. Now, as I said, thermodynamics had two parts. One had dealt with transformations, which not necessarily has to be uh, slow. But for sl small deviations from equilibrium, again, there is a systematic uh, theory it's called linear response theory, uh, which comes by the names of Hornsager, Green Kubo, and fluctuation dissipation theorem. And we have already heard a little bit about this. But otherwise, there were not no general, generally applicable results beyond that linear response regime. And in 93, was quite a surprise when uh, the Evans, Cohen, and Morris in numerical simulations of, of two-dimensional <coughs> shear fluids found a relation, a remarkable relation, which is now one variant uh, under this label of the fluctuation theorem. Later then, the theorem was proven in various, in various contexts. And I will show you a, a, a simple proof using stochastic dynamics. And uh, at that time, I think independently, 1997, uh, the no another pillar of this field was found, which was the Arzinski relation. And then in the following years, people realized there, there is one big framework unifying all these ideas. And this is the one I, I prefer to call stochastic thermodynamics. OK. Oh, yeah, 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 good point. So I should, I should clarify from the outset. I will 
exclusively deal with classical systems. Uh, many of these things can be done in, in a quantum setting, uh, but I will, I will focus on classical systems. Okay, so for a start at the set notation, just one, one reminder, one slight reminder on classical thermodynamics as we teach it. So suppose you have this uh, system initially that piston is at this, this position lambda naught, and now you compress this fluid or gas or whatever while this whole thing is in contact with the heat bath, and you can compress fast. Well, this will cost you some work. At the end, the position of this piston is here, and then classical thermodynamics tells you two things. Number one, first law energy balance. The work you spend either increases the internal energy of the system or is dissipated as heat into this environment. Now, since that uh, environment is a heat bath, you can directly associate the heat dissipated in the heat bath with the entropy increase of the medium. So in my lecture, sub M will be medium bath, the surroundings. And I will mostly uh, look at situations where we have one heat bath with a uh, given temperature T. This is just energy conservation. And then there's the second law which tells you that the entropy of the universe cannot decrease in any process, which and the entropy uh, change of the universe is the entropy change of the system and the entropy change in the medium. Now if you combine these two relations, uh, you find that the work you have spent, you have to spend in this transformation is at, at least as big as the free energy difference corresponding to final state at this position and initial state at this position. And sometimes it's useful to call the excess work the dissipated work, which cannot be negative. Okay, so so much for classical thermodynamics, and this is something uh, everybody, everybody knows. The question now is whether these concepts and these notions can be extended to smaller scales. Um, and that's not entirely trivial. I mean, I think there are some cosmologists and string theorists around, and they are proud of the enormous substrate. So here is the substrate, here's the colloidal particle. There is some short-range repulsion. So this is the potential energy of the colloidal particle as a function of the distance from the substrate. So there is obviously, I mean, it's, it's a strong rep repulsion. So here is a linear attractive potential. This looks a little bit like gravity, but it's not caused by gravity. It's caused by another laser field, which is pushing the particle towards the substrate. And you have to believe me, because I believe them, that this effectively is a linear potential, which depends on the intensity of the laser field. Now, for fixed laser field, this is just a static potential, and you could measure the histogram of the, uh, of the particle position in this potential, and of course you would get the Boltzmann factor, and this is how, how we um, calibrate the this, this, uh, strength of this uh, linear part. But now the point is that you can change the intensity of this laser in a time-dependent fashion, let's say sinusoidally, which means that effectively you're looking now at the motion of this colloidal particle in a time-dependent potential where the strength of this attractive part goes like sine omega t. You can measure the position, the distance of the colloidal particle from the substrate by optical means very accurately, which means you get the trajectory, you get this trajectory x of t. Then I go back to the previous slide and feed this trajectory into these equations. And I have a, a sinusoidal, I have a sinusoidal variation of this lambda parameter, and now I just integrate work, heat, and change in internal energy per period period is called pulse here, and I do it for 200 periods. So in, the, on, in this graph, you see the black curve is the work put into the particle. 
And again, you should notice the scale. We're talking about 5 to 10 kBT per period. The red curve is the dissipated heat. The green curve, which you can hardly see, is the change in internal energy from period to period. This is just the boundary term. <coughs> now, in a perfect world, the three terms per pulse per period should then add to zero. The blue curve is the arrow. This is the histogram of the arrow. So you see there's a precision of about half a kBT with which these quantities work, dissipated heat, change in internal energy can be measured in this experiment. Which I think is, is quite nice. Second insight from this experiment. I said that previously, before this experiment, people only looked at harmonic traps and there the work distribution is always Gaussian. This you can prove for any speed. But here, at least those sitting bull bull, you should see that this curve here is visibly non-Gaussian. And what, what do we plot here? So the gray stuff are the experimental data. So this is the distribution of work, let's say, after, I think, 20 periods. Uh, the gray curve are the experimental data. The red curve is theory, no fitting parameter. And you know, this is the reasonable 5% agreement, 5% position, which you typically have with these colloidal particles. Um, there, is, there, is, there is an uh, important lesson here. This distribution is non-Gaussian. You can prove that as long as you are in the linear response regime, irrespectively of the nature of the potential, and the time depends on the, of the driving, as long as you're in the linear response regime, <coughs> i.e. close to genuine thermodynamic equilibrium, work distributions are always Gaussian. So the agreement between theory and experiment shows you that the Langevin equation with this type of noise <coughs> still given by the equilibrium strength is a valid description even beyond linear response. Yes, please. Yes. So the fluctuating entropy, is it due to the external noise in the zeta, or is it because of something else? It is due, yes. Uh, the fluctuating contribution to the entropy change of the uh, medium is due to the fact that we have a stochastic equation of motion, i.e. due to the noise. You know, because sometimes the noise transfers energy to the particle. So, so suppose you don't have this external force, and suppose you, you have a fixed potential. I mean, I can, I can still do that, but of course then there is no applied work. But if the particle sits here, and if it thermally climbs up there, its internal energy has increased at the expense of the internal energy of the surrounding heat bath, i.e. for such a trajectory where it climbs up here, the um, entropy change of the surrounding heat bath is negative. Okay. Um, yeah, <coughs> there are now two modifications to this very simple picture. Uh, perhaps I should first do what I announced here. So suppose we have this situation, for instance, where we have this bead in the trap, but here is this whole uh, RNA molecule and then you might be suspicious that this picture is a little bit too simplistic. This was also the question whether this can be done if the driving affects other degrees of freedom. So let me sketch how you would do that. So suppose microscopically you have a potential energy which depends on all degrees of freedom and on some external parameter lambda. So this psi in principle, are the 10 to the 23 molecules <coughs> of water, or perhaps uh, less ambitiously, 
include uh, side chains if this was a protein and so on. So certainly we don't want to do dynamics on this scale. So the idea is that if we take if we take all these psi molecules, uh, microstates, we box them into mesostates. <coughs> and these mesostates I label with x. And one possible mesostate, for instance, would be just the position of the speed, if I forget all the rest. Or I could use the, these five positions. So the key point is that to each mesostate, Belong a, belongs a certain number of these uh, microstates. <coughs> okay, and then the key idea, the key assumption is that if you fix the mesostate and if you fix the external potential, that then these microscopic degrees of freedom are in constrained uh, equilibrium. So, so <coughs> if I want to do this. Yeah, so, so this, this would be e to the minus phi of psi given comma lambda. So for fixed x, I'm using this here. This microscopic energy does not know about the x. I'm doing it like this. There is a free energy which now knows about the x and the lambda, and I get this free energy as a function of x and lambda by the usual rule. So I sum now sum over psi. All the psi's which belong to this basin corresponding to a certain x, I sum this factor. Okay. So this will this this will this will define a free energy on this mesoscale x and lambda. Okay. And now, if you look, if you want to identify work and heat. You have to change this external control parameter in order to apply work to the system. So a uh, reasonable identification is that you say, OK, if the system is in microstate psi, I will pay the lambda phi of psi and lambda times the probability that, that I am in this state given the x and given the lambda. Okay, and this I have to sum over all microstates contributing, contributing to this x. And then this would be the increment in work if I change the lambda and I know where my meso variables are. So this 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 is the identification of the work. And you can now also write this as d lambda f d lambda. So you see, compared, compared to here, we just have to replace the internal energy by this uh, coarse-grained free energy, which works on the level of these mesostates, where we have integrated out all the water molecules. Then, of course, uh, the first law, which you would want to write in the form change of the internal energy plus the dissipated heat, this change in internal energy, of course, is in internal energy is in the state x and lambda, is the sum over all psi belonging to this basin and then it's just the energy of this microstate times the probability to be there. Okay, you plug that in, you work it out, it turns out that 
you, ident you have to identify the dissipated heat, in this case, as the minus the gradient of this free energy. And, and that's key, there is now an additional contribution which depends on the fact that when you change the external control parameter, the, there is an internal en entropy of each microstate. And if that depends on the lambda, you have to include that term. So I recommend to the students to work this out in detail. And if you get lost, look in my review in section 9.2, where this is explained. Yes, please. Uh, no, sorry, this is bad notation, yes. I this, is free energy, this is free energy, I apologize. I should have done, I should have done curly or ones. Or curly ones, yes. yes. I'm sorry for that. So I'm confused about the sign in your probability distribution. Is it e to the minus pi and then minus? Yeah, I should have done a bracket or let me do it like this. Yes, thank you, Bobo. Okay. Um, one more line, one more line. If we now look at in such a meso description on the dynamics of the x over damped, we have to use the gradient of this free energy. Of course, now with, with respect to x, here is some mobility tensor. And again, there is some noise. And the correlations of the noise are given by the Einstein relation, delta in time. And you see, again, compared to the simple colloidal case, which does not have internal degrees of freedom, um, we have to replace this potential by the free energy. And then this equation ensures, guarantees, that in the long time limit, the probability distribution for this x goes to the e to the minus this f of x and lambda as it should. So this shows that whatever the degrees of freedom you're dealing with, the x degrees of freedom, have internal structure, then you have to use this kind of modification. And then you also have to be a little bit more careful when you want to identify the heat correctly. You have to include this, what I prefer to call the intrinsic entropy. And I should warn you that you will find uh, quite some instances in the literature where this difference uh, was not dealt with properly. OK, any questions? Yes, please. So I mean, there's one thing confusing about this, which is maybe answered by what you just said, but I'm not sure. Yes. I mean, the equations on the slide refer to a single realization of the noise, right? In a single trajectory? No, I mean the Langevin, the Langevin equation. Uh, the on the bottom. The yes, all this, yes? Yeah. Ah. So, so uh, therefore, you're supposed to think of those as applying when the heat bath is doing one particular thing out of all the yes. things the heat bath could do. Yes. So I don't know what the, that entropy is that you're talking about that has changed in this one instance. Because no, I mean if I in, if I integrate this one instance from initial time to final time, if I integrate this increment, I get the change in heat. Uh, in, in in medium entropy, i.e., I get the heat along this specific trajectory. If I had had measured another trajectory, I would have found a different change in entropy. But we're just talking about one uh, uh, one history of the map. Yes. Yes, and I insist that for this one history, the entropy change of the bath is well but defined. But it doesn't. One history of the bath doesn't have an entropy; only an ensemble of histories. Has no, that's, no that's my key point. That's my key point. What I want you is that you try to follow um, this kind of logic, and that for a moment you forget what you have been taught 
in, in so, so maybe the other way of saying it is if you write it this way, you find you have to define something, which is the analog of it. Yes. Now you can, you can say, I don't want to do that. I only want to think about entropy on the ensemble level. But then you will miss something exciting. And I will show you that all this is consistent. Should, should I think of an ensemble of p gap mysteries that all do the same thing to x? And I consider all of those, and those have an entry. That ensemble no, 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 please don't. No. No, just, just, just you should think of it following these rules. You ha you okay. it, think about experiment. You know, this is, this, but that's why experiments are so important. Think about, think about this experiment. Well, at, at this point, it may look a little bit formal, but um, I don't think it's too formal. I mean, if you look, if you look at this, if you really do this experiment, you know, if I go to the lab of my colleagues, they will show me, they will show me this trace. Okay. Now, nothing forbids me to follow the suggestion of Sekimoto and working out these quantities for this specific realization. And then if I plot the work or the heat, uh, I get this value. And then I do this 200 times. I get the histogram. No, sure. As a formal definition, yes. I want to do that. OK, so let, at this point, let's keep it as a formal definition. And we will see later how it relates to what we have been taught. Yes? No, it's not due to the measurement. I mean, even if I, if I don't look, it will fluctuate. Ah, the next transference. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. This, this, half K, this one half KBT here is experimental error. Just measurement error. Just measurement error. Just measurement error. Just measurement error. This is, this, is, this is just measurement error. This error here could be due to the fact that I'm no longer allowed to use longer equations. So if I take a beta microscope and a better uh, time bar, I would go down? I would hope so, yes. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, this is already pretty good. And if we didn't have any error here, uh, referees would certainly have complained about the error box. OK. Um, yeah. Well, look, yes, the question was, within experimental accuracy, have I, have I shown the first law? No, I, I would not go so far because, as uh, Math and others pointed out, I mean, at this point, these are, in a sense, formal definitions, identifications. And what I've shown, you see, in order to prove the first law on this scale, real physical proof, you would have to measure the heat independently, nanocalorimetrically, which is impossible. You cannot measure 5 kBT. So what I've shown you that this is a scheme where you can identify these quantities consistently, consistently uh, using using this framework. I'm not going. I don't want to claim that this proves the first law on this scale. It's a consistent scheme which will be helpful for many for many questions. Having this notion on the trajectory level. Okay. Um, I wanted to tell you about another modification uh, which you have to do with the fact that you have the system, um, the system in uh, hydrodynamic flow. But let's not let's pos postpone this uh, if there is time at the end because this will be more important. And I'm, I'm happy for your questions. And the lectures are planned in a way that uh, we can essentially stop then any any time. Okay. So there are three theoretical descriptions. This is now for the students. There are three theoretical descriptions 
with which you can formulate stochastic dynamics. Not stochastic thermodynamics, but stochastic dynamics, and they're all equivalent. And in the continuous case, it's the Langevin equation, which we have seen, it's the Fokker-Planck equation, which Abhishek introduced, and which I will talk more about uh, in, in my second lecture. And there's this third one, which is very important, and which many of you know, presumably better from quantum mechanics, and this is the path integral description. And in order to prove these fluctuation theorems uh, in a stochastic, for stochastic dynamics, as I'm, I'm doing it here, it's the simple way of proving these things is using uh, the path integral, which is something conceptually uh, quite simple. And the idea is the following one. Yes. Um, well, let's see. Uh, Schrödinger is a little bit like like Fokker Planck. Um, no, uh, this has nothing to do with Schrödinger and Heisenberg picture. It's a path integral. I mean, the Feynman path integral from quantum mechanics. Okay. So how does it how does it come enter here? So let's take this case. So we have. Let me write this. F total force depending on some external parameter and I have the noise. And I told you the noise at time tau 1 correlation noise, noise at time tau 2 has to be 2 mu kBT delta in the times. Okay, how do I generate this noise? I can generate noise with these correlations by assuming the probability for a whole noise history is given up to normalization by 1 to the minus um, 4 mu kBT integral d tau 0 to t theta squared of tau. So this Gaussian weight will generate noise precisely with these correlations. And now it's a, it's a trivial step to include, to replace in the exponent the noise, Abhishek mentioned this, by the Langevin equation. Okay, so there is, there is a Jacobian, depending on the discretization, uh, for those who are technically inclined, if you do this, I very strongly recommend that you use Stratonovich throughout, in which case there is such a contribution, but it will not show up in the uh, equations I will be deriving, and therefore I'm leaving it out here. Yes? Well, if you do things right, you, you, you get the right one. You, uh, the question is, when you do Stratonovich, uh, do you get the wrong Fokker-Planck equation? I mean, this is an endless debate. If you do things correctly, everything works out. You can do it using any discretization. I prefer Stratonovich because you can use the ordinary rules of calculus. And if I, if I do a Fokker-Planck, I just have to do the correct one. Yes, Hogan. Okay. May I just add one little thing? About yes. If you add it, if you were including the inertial term, Thing. Yeah. Goes away. It goes away. Yeah. Goes away. Yes, yes, yes. No. Yeah. This is a. You know. You have to be a little bit careful, but it's it's no deep issue. Okay. So this is. Uh, you see here it again. So I'm using here capital D. That's the diffusion constant. Um, and D is mu kBT. Okay. So presumably I should have blocked the slide because you are looking at the slide and not what I'm doing here. Okay, so this is, this is this, the, the weight for this noise, um, and then I transform this into a weight. Okay, replacing the noise by the Langevin equation, I get the weight for a trajectory. This is trivial. And now let's look at the red and the blue situation. The blue situation is the real physical situation. I have a control parameter, which I change in a time-dependent way from lambda naught to some lambda final 
think it's, oh, it's lambda one or final angle lambda t sorry and I may measure I may measure this blue trajectory and now just just as a concept I imagine time reversal so I'm defining a tilde quantities which I get by looking at the trajectory with the reverse uh, time and accordingly I have to change the protocol and now I ask myself what is the ratio of the probability of these two trajectories occurring and I'm repeating uh, what Abhishek has done so the probability for the original trajectory and you have to include here initial initial state is given by this expression the probability for uh, the reverse trajectory happening under the reverse protocol which would enter this force so I did not include this here to keep the whole thing uh, on one line is given by this expression now you do the square you see the square is x dot squared and here you get x tilde dot squared but these square terms are identical if you integrate them likewise this term squared integrated becomes this term squared integrated using these rules however if you look at the mixed term the mixed term changes sign which means that when you divide the two exponents you're left with the mixed term which is the integral over the velocity times the force I told you that in this overdamped situation two slides ago we had identified force types displacement with an increment in heat so what we find here and that's really that's important what we find is that the ratio of these probabilities is exponential in the heat corresponding to the real forward process i.e. physically speaking if your forward trajectory particle starts here and you know again you can do that why is it doing this? you can do that in equilibrium all these relations remain true if we apply it to an ex equilibrium situation and again for the students I recommend that whenever you do these things always think about what does it mean in an equilibrium situation so if you have a particle in this potential suppose initially we place it here or we start observing it once it is here we will typically find that it goes down that will be a probable path in this probable path it will lose internal energy there is no work involved this internal energy along this trajectory has to be dissipated in the work in, in, in the heat bath so e to the q will be positive and large this tells me that the likelihood, the probability of observing the backward trajectory is rare. It's, it's much more unlikely. Okay. So if you do the this uh this the Jacobian cancels and actually if you do the other uh Nito this thing and the Jacobian cancel. If you do Ito? Yeah. The same the no, 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 no. I mean, this is now a physical statement. This is a physical no, property. I'm saying that uh, there will be another term in front of the exponential for the forward trajectory and backward trajectory, and the extra term is actually cancelled. Mm, uh, uh, no, I, I would say if you do a Sotonovich in principle, there's a Jacobian, and they are they cancel. Yeah, in E2, you don't have you don't have the Jacobian. No, yeah, Sotonovich. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes. That, yeah, yeah. As you know, it's yes. you know what you what you get is uh, you, you 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 get f prime or v v double prime integral, and that then that that cancels. That's why I don't want to bother with this. Yes. So I think that the Well, just be patient for my next slide. I will be doing it, but I wanted to explain this uh, carefully. So far, there's no summation. It's a statement. 
just about probabilities of observing certain events compared to the probability of observing the time reversed event. Now, now I will do what uh, Abhishek has done, so we can be we can be fast here. Okay, so this is these are three lines, and with these three lines you can you can derive an infinity of fluctuation relations. And, you know, it's almost embarrassingly uh, trivial. So let's start with the obvious. You have to, we now start with this fictitious reversed process. So, so suppose we have a, a tilde process where we start with a normalized initial condition and we sum over all paths given this initial condition. So normalization requires that this sum over all events is 1. That's a triviality. Now we multiply and divide by the physically given initial condition of the forward process, of the real process, times the weight for any real trajectory given that initial point and we, we multiply and we divide. Nothing happened. I just showed you that this ratio here, the first part of this ratio, is the dissipated heat. And now the, the uh, sign is changing because I have tilde, I have the backward thing over the forward thing. And in the previous slide I had it the other way around. So this, this here is just e to the minus beta q which is the change in entropy of the medium. And I put these things, I put in the exponent. And this summation over all forward path with this weight, that's just the non-equilibrium ensemble we're interested in. We're assuming we have given an initial probability and some, <coughs> some time-dependent force. And with these brackets, I denote the average over all forward trajectories given this weight. So one is this. And the average is now over that particular couple. The average is over the forward trajectories given an initial ensemble for the forward trajectories and given this weight I've just derived. I should say, you see here we have sum over the reverse trajectories, here we sum over the forward trajectories. As Abhishek has explained, this is the same summation. Uh, so those who are not convinced to do that, you can, all, you can fill in one more line here and one more line there, but it's as simple as that. Now, this derivation is true for any initial condition P0 of X0. Any initial condition. I don't have to start in thermal equilibrium. And it's true for any function of the final point because I was free to choose any normalized distribution for the initial point of this fictitious backward process. So X tilde naught becomes xt. Okay? So this is, this is true for any choice, any choice of physical initial condition here and any choice of normalized function p1 of the end point. Uh, the, log is, the, log is, the log is up in the exponential. Yes, it should be up. Is the, is the bracket missing? No? 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 You see, this, this bracket here is here, closing here. And then there are the average brackets. So it's, it's OK. Thank you. OK, now let's do, uh, I mean, this is, this is formal. So now let's do something with that. OK. Um, let's derive the Yazinski relation. The Yazinski relation is here. I'll show you how you prove it using this uh, more general class of integral relations. So what I've, what I've just proven is this one. And I've, I'm free to choose any P1. 
Now let me choose at this arbitrary function of the final point the Boltzmann distribution which would, corres which would correspond to thermal equilibrium at this final point. I can do that. It does not mean that my distribution has reached equilibrium. I don't care what the, what the real distribution is. I, I'm, the, the proof holds true for any of these functions. And now you see um, you plug that in and you use the first law that the delta Q and the delta V leads to the delta W, which is the work. Uh, from here you get the F, so you get this KVT is one here. You get this in one line. And you should compare this proof to the proof Abhishek has shown you. Abhishek has derived it using Hamiltonian dynamics. This is the derivation for stochastic dynamics. The relation is true in both settings. So P1 and P0 are completely arbitrary. It's for me to choose the distribution depending. So if I measure no. those distributions, I'll put those in? No, 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 no. P0 is the distribution with or which P you start. Right. So, so and if, if I measure you those, I'm just saying. Yeah, if you measure that, but of course, you, you won't get Yazinski if you don't start with, th with thermal equilibrium. And we will, we, will, we will discuss what we get when we use other things later, next, I mean, tomorrow. And P1, in order to get Yazinski, you have to use P1. And again, P1 of XT will not be the true distribution. Okay? I will, so I will that's what I um, guess I'm trying to, so what is the meaning of P1 in the original, just trying to go back to your very general. Well, yes, the meaning, the meaning of P1, the meaning of P1 is the fictitious distribution of the backward process. But this is a completely fictitious process. It does not happen in the lab. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, but I'm free to use any P1 here. Okay. And P1 and P0 are micro. Uh, P1 microcanonical is perfectly fine. And P0 should start with microcanonical. <coughs> perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. Do you get perfectly something, you something simple? Or? Yeah, you get what I call the uh, integral. For the, for the initial, you get the integral for the entropy production. If you do both uh, microcanonical, you get something which you know does not look spectacular. I mean, it's always they all differ by this boundary terms. I, I will talk about more uh, about this freedom uh, in, in tomorrow's lecture. How do you see that the switch from summing over reverse pass to forward pass doesn't have any trouble without referring to the dynamics? Oh no no this is this is just uh, You know, I mean, if I, uh, let's say, the, the real ones are x0, if I discretize, right, x1, x2, x3, the backward ones are x tilde naught. I mean, <coughs> yes? Do you really need a Gaussian button in order to get this? I, I, uh, yes, yes. I mean, I need, I need, I need this thing here. You can do these things with memory, but I would not know how to do it if you had something more complicated for which. Like if you had a colored noise or something. No, no, that's okay. That's memory, colored noise is okay, but uh, I would not be very happy. I mean, you know, I don't know whether what I would do if I had something like this up here in this corner. No, no, no. I mean, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not assuming linear response. You see, my x, my x degrees of freedom are arbitrarily far from equilibrium. But what I assume is that the path adjusts fast to any given x position. This is what I had on the previous slide here when I had these psi coordinates, and I was assuming for fixed x configuration, I have the corresponding Boltzmann distribution for the psi. This is an essential assumption, in my opinion. This is really separation of scale. Separation of time scales. Certainly, separation of time scales. If you have 
slow degrees of freedoms which are not under your control, these things get destroyed. And uh, in a recent experiment and theory, we have actually explored that. Uh, the role of slow hidden degrees of freedom on the fluctuation theorem, but I will not have time to talk about that. So that's a, that's a caveat. That's, that's a big caveat. Have... That's, that's a big caveat which needs to be emphasized. You have to have time scale separation. You, that's what I mean. You have Temperature must be well defined. You have to have the fast heat bound. Could you still consider that the system will finally reach to an equilibrium state, right? Well, as long as I fix the lambda and as long as I don't have non-conservative forces here, yes, then it will reach the equilibrium state. Yeah. So for the next slide, when you choose uh, for the next slide. What? Have you already seen the next slide? Yeah. yeah this one. Yes, this one. Yes, yes. yes. So, do you still consider, right? And, uh, oh. Otherwise? Well, no. I insist on that after time t, the system in reality will not be in equilibrium. But then, of course, I, then I stop my process. There is no more lambda change, i.e. no more work. And as Abhishek explained, then it will just relax on a certain time scale to, true, to this distribution. So there is still something going on between after stopping the protocol, but this does, this does not involve work. It does involve heat. But in Yazinski, we care about the work. OK? Good. Let's see. Yeah, so let me uh, add a little bit more information to Yazinski. Uh, I think we said that the force key is it's valid for any protocol, it's valid beyond the linear response regime. Uh, it initially, it was quite an excitement because it seemed to allow to extract free energies from the uh, non-equilibrium data. Of course, you know you have to realize this is a non-linear average, and rare events may contribute substantially. So you have to be a little bit careful with the statistics, and uh, there's a whole field of people trying to deal with that. And it was pointed out that, of course, this implies uh, this form of the second law. I put this in quotation marks because I do not want, I do not want to sell this, and neither uh, Yazinski ever did sell this as a proof of the second law, because what you have to appreciate, in a sense, we have put in a substantial amount of our knowledge about the second law when we started here. Now, I don't think it's a proof of the second law. Some people think it is. I don't. Distribution of this dissipated work. Uh, there are these events, and you have to have these events because clearly, if it dissipated work, if all events were positive, e to the minus would never be one. So you need to have these events, which some people called as violations of the second law or transient violations of the second law. Again, I would not endorse this notion. Nobody ever claimed that the second law should hold for a single realization. Now, if you know for whatever reason that you have a Gaussian distribution for the work or dissipated work, then of course the mean and the variance are restricted through this one relation. So it's an interesting question to ask when do you have Gaussian distributions for the work? One scenario is what, what we've proven here is, as I said, any potential, any non conservative force. If you do it slowly enough, you can prove that you have to you necessarily get Gaussian distribution. By the way, again, this is not true for heat. Heat is not a Gaussian. Uh, and if you have linear equations of motions, then you can even drive fast. Again, you necessarily get a Gaussian distribution. So one example, for instance, is this uh, Rouse model of a polymer. So Rouse model says that you just look at a chain of harmonic springs. And now you can fix this one. And you can pull this one. You can pull it with arbitrary speed. Uh, linear equations of motion lead, lead to a linear um, distribution. And just as an illustration, so suppose you, you have such a molecule and you want to stretch it uh, in time and you use two different protocols. So if you use a linear protocol, uh, you get as average work 
n is the number of monomers, gamma is the friction constant, l is the length. Now if you did a quarter of a sine wave, you, you know, just for illustration, you work it out, you get essentially, of course, the same uh, thing here, but the numerical prefactor is pi squared over 8, which is about 20% more. So this is just one example where you see that, of course, the mean depends on the protocol, the mean of this quantity, even if you fix initial and final point, if you do it this way, it will cost you 20% more than if you do it the blue way. However, the full distribution has to uh, obey the Yajitsky relation. <laughs> no, if you drive with a random force, no. Not with a uh, random force, but if you drive with a nonlinear time dependent deterministic force, then you still do that. Okay, um, and of course, this points already uh, to the idea which I wanted to touch in the, the last uh, five minutes or so, just as an illustration. Uh, I mean, one interesting question in the field now is how, what is the optimal driving? And we had this in other lectures. How do you change uh, external parameter in a time-dependent way in such a fashion that you pay the least amount of work? And there is a, there is a surprise. So before I show you the answer, let me ask you the question. Again, a simple case. Uh, you can work out the details in, the, in a tutorial if you want. So suppose initially you have a colloidal particle in a parabolic trap, and so initially you have this kind of Gaussian distribution. And the task is to move this trap in finite time to some final position. So initially lambda is at zero. So the potential is a given, uh, has a stiffness, constant curvature, and x is the position of the particle, and lambda of tau is the center of the trap. And the task is in time t to go from lambda not zero to a final value of lambda f. OK. So. I know that some people in the audience do know the uh, result. They should be quiet. But those who see this for the first time, suppose you have to perform this, ta this task in finite time. What is the cheapest way? Where do you have to invest the least amount of work on average when you move this to here? Think about, you know, think about this parabolic potential of just being a spring connected to this point and you have to move this point and the bead reacts to this time dependent motion. So suggestions from the back part of the audience. <coughs> Those who still follow me. What would be a, a reasonable naive guess how to do that? So you want a curve for lambda versus t? I want a curve for lambda versus t and I give you one example which is bad. It's bad if you first move to here <coughs> and then you come back here. That's a bad suggestion. Excuse me? Yes, you go directly, you go directly from here to there. Who, who thinks that this is the best solution? Okay, those who don't think that, better suggestions? Okay, so his suggestion is you go fast and then you slow down. Okay? Good. So I have to admit I thought this was best. We looked at the more complicated problem and I had assigned it to a student and he did the numerics and he got some quite strange results. So essentially what he found numerically that it looked like this. And then I asked him to look at the phone and then it all didn't make sense. And then we came up with a simpler example, which you can analytically. And what you find is that the best solution is not this one. Uh, 
you, you jump and then you go with constant velocity to here and then you jump again. And there's an optimum jump? Yes. There is an optimum there is an optimum jump. So this this jump, the delta lambda jump, that goes uh, in dimensionless units, this goes like t over two plus no one over two plus t, I think. Let's see, I have it here. Yeah, so this was the question. How do you do this uh, in finite time? And here is, yes. What well, exactly are you trying to minimize? Ah, the work. So I, I told you we have a work which depends on the trajectory. And of course, it depends on the protocol. So let me now average this for fixed protocol over many realizations. Makes no sense to minimize the single trajectory value. Very good question. Yes, of course, I minimize. Should have said I mean I want to minimize this, and the minimum is for is over all possible lambda protocols. So you need you have these jumps, and it turns out that if you compare again this optimized red trajectory with the blue one you can, in the best case, gain 12%. Is uh, w squared, uh, we haven't checked that. That's a good question. I think one of the students approached me with this, with this question. Um, OK. So in t plus 2, what's setting the scale for t? Oh, yes. These are dimensionless units where, where I have uh, the relaxation time in the trap which is given by, let's see, x dot is minus mu k x. So the relaxation time in the trap is 1 over mu k. This, I'm using these units. So it takes time 1 to equilibrate. And you see, as time goes to infinity, the size of these jumps goes to 0. Of course, if I had allocated an infinite amount of time to this process, I, I'm in quasi-static regime and I reach work zero because there's no free energy change involved. It becomes a non-trivial question only if you have to perform this task in finite time. And uh, observing these jumps was, was quite a surprise. Now there was a uh, suspicion, Roy Zia, uh, some of you might know him, asked me, Udo, does it depend on the fact that you have use, using overdamp dynamics, that you've lost the inertia terms? You know, we're doing this with this overdamped dynamics. So we subsequently did it with the uh, inertia terms. And then it turns out that it gets even worse. So this is the last line here. So if you do inertia, if you include the inertia terms, the optimal protocol is actually involves delta excursions. Now I should tell you where the singularities come from. What is the physics behind it? The physics behind this jump. The, the physics behind this jump is the following one. If you suddenly displace the potential a little bit, you instantaneously create a certain force. And then this force on the beat, the average force on the beat remains constant. And that leads, in effect, to less dissipation than when you build up slowly the force, because then you have to, then you have to go, f if you build up slowly the force here, you have to go faster on average, which means more dissipation than if you have, uh, you see here the slope is less than that. That's the physical reason for the slope. And likewise, in the underdamped case, what you want is, you want that you instantaneously create the average velocity. So you have, to, you, have, you have to have a jump in the momentum, which requires this delta excursion uh, in the potential. So the lesson is that when you optimize these quantities, and if you do it in a more complex problem where you have no analytical insight, be aware th of the possibility that your numerics turns crazy, because n numerics tries to, to mimic these singularities. That, that, that would be the lesson here.
No, no. I mean, this we this is we have we have an analy analytical theory proving that in this case uh, this is this is the optimal. And I recommend you for a tutorial to repeat this calculation. It's a, it's a nice calculation. Euler Lagrange. You have to be a little bit careful with the boundaries. So you will learn a lot if you try to do that. Okay. So the periodic thing, has somebody done it uh, in, in many periods. Optimizing. So how, how is exactly <coughs> the shape you have to So, of course, you would have to specify something more. So, so well, the end yeah. Well, I mean, you would, I guess you would have to specify the minima and maxima. Yeah. Uh, Not that I'm aware of, uh, Sanjit, you know? No, I don't think so. You know, in the general case, it's not, it leads to, to time non-local um, integral differential equation. So it's a time non-local problem in Euler Lacan. So it's not it's not trivial. Yes, please. The size no no the size of the jumps uh, is really given by the time allocated to this process. So the more time I have, the the, the less the less big are the jumps. Okay. Uh, Yes, please. Is there any evidence that um, mechanical things inside cells actually do optimization? Oh, it's a good question. Uh, we tried we tried to look at uh, optimization in um, in replication. Uh, this is a hot topic. This is a hot topic now, and I think juries are still out. But this is certainly one possible application of these things. Let me show you just two minutes. Uh, two transparencies uh, so that uh, I can close this lecture which I, where I started talking about thermodynamics, classical thermodynamics and as you all know uh, in classical thermodynamics one of the main thing that's the left hand side is the Carnot machine which has a beautiful um, expression for the efficiency uh, this is the most efficient heat engine you can imagine but of course this efficiency, Carnot efficiency, comes at the price of zero power. Because you have to do the cycle quasi-statically, which means that you have an infinite time for the cycle, you get out a finite amount of work. Power is work divided by time, so the power of a Carnot engine is, is, is zero. So, 75, Kirsten Albon, be again, beautiful paper, paper, American Journal of Physics, asked the question, what is the efficiency at maximum power? So they now include the losses due to this finite heat transfer, and they found a cute expression which almost looks like Carnot, but just involves the square root. And then there were recent debates, I don't want to go into too much detail here, recent debates whether or not this is universal, whether it's a true bound, and we asked ourselves, what is what are the role of fluctuations? So now having all these tools, I mean we have defined work, we have defined heat, we theoretically built this little heat engine where we couple the Langevin particle here to a hot heat bath, here we decouple it, we change the potential, that is where, that's like pushing, uh, pulling a piston, uh, so you can do a full cycle, this is at a cold temperature, and again you find an expression uh, for the efficiency at maximum power, which uh, is not the Curzon-Albon uh, relation. So this shows that the Curzon-Albon is neither universal nor a bound. Again, you get something which looks almost uh, universal. There is one machine-specific uh, parameter. And I'm just showing you this because uh, there is this beautiful experiment very recently, also from, from Stuttgart, where they did this really experimentally, so they did, they did not quite the Carnot cycle, but the Stirling cycle, but they could do that. How do, you do, it? How do they do it? They take the particle in the laser trap and then they locally heat it, which is very efficient, by an extra laser. And when you turn that off, it cools down, so you can calculate all the thermodynamic quantities, and I think it's a beautiful demonstration that using these concepts, you can now address the question of this admittedly somewhat artificial heat engine on this micron scale. And with this kind of uh, transparency, I would like to close for today. Tomorrow, we will, I will say more on this notion of entropy production along stochastic uh, trajectories. 
And I will also talk about, because there is an intimate relation, as you will see, about the fluctuation dissipation theorem, but not around equilibrium, but around non-equilibrium steady states. So thanks for now, and I'm still happy to take questions. Uh, yeah, so, 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 so this, is, this is maximized with respect to the cycle time. This is maximized with respect to the cycle time. But again, you know, what you get from these engines is kt, k of the order of kt per cycle. Alright, so for a given cycle time, you have what the total load is, and that's the maximum load. <coughs> no, no, no. I mean, for a given, given setup, uh, and so basically, I mean, there are basically two parameters which you can change here which is the width, the width of this trap and the cycle time. And you optimize with respect to both. Yes, please. So here we fix the protocol to be Sterling or Carnot. No, they, no, no. I mean, they, 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 couldn't, they couldn't do the, they couldn't do the Carnot thing. They couldn't <laughs> do the Carnot thing. But th what, what they did here is, here they change, here they change the, uh, the potential at constant temperature, isothermal expansion, and here they just cool it at fixed potential. And this is fixed position of the piston. This is this is Stirling. So in, in the Carnot, in, even in the adiabatic yeah. case, you change you change the volume accordingly. But my question is whether uh, if you wanted to optimize, so you, for fixed power, you want the largest efficiency. You probably wouldn't follow Carnot. You is it true that uh, you would actually optimize your uh, protocol so you wouldn't necessarily follow Carnot anymore in terms of the cycle? Yes, time? yes, yes, and you don't. Yes, yes, that's true. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, is Carnot. It known the no, well, I don't think it's universal. I mean, you have to do it. I mean, here for the parabolic case, it's quite a bit has been done, but if you use different potentials, you would have different protocols. I mean, these this optimal solutions for maximum power, it's a whole industry. Uh, also now in devices, and we, we, we are part of this, but it, it's, it's a less universal question than just the question of Carnot, which was what is the largest reach possible efficiency, irrespective of power. So it seemed that you were trying to apply the notion of thermodynamics to single stochastic yes, trajectory. Yes. But then really it turned out you were applying thermodynamics to the heat bath, which you assumed to be in equilibrium with the trajectory. I, I wouldn't say I applied it to the heat bath. I would say that uh, in order to apply it to the single trajectory, I still assume that I have a heat bath, and uh, I deal with that according to the rules which I have laid out. But it's certainly not, no, no, I mean, it's not supposed to be a new theory for, for heat bath. It's, it's really a theory for systems which are externally, typically mechanically, hydrodynamically, biochemically put out of equilibrium, but which are still interacting with lots of fast model molecules. And you know, it's not a bad assumption for, for all of soft matter, for all of biology, and for many of these uh, electronic devices using in F FCS and so on. Yes? Yeah, the meaning of, of, of this jump is, so, so suppose you would not jump. So I, I, I put, I pull this, uh, and you know, imagine, imagine the bead originally being at the origin. That's, that's the representative situation. So if, so initially the, the spring has zero length, and then I pull slowly, and then I move. So what will happen is the length builds up. I either force slowly builds up, stretching of the tether, and then, it moves at constant velocity. And it turns out that initially you have less dissipation, but you also lose time. Because as you see, if you go this, uh, if you do this straight away, the average velocity is larger. It's better first to displace it, the tether, to the point which corresponds to the average friction you, would, you then have in this, along this blue curve. 